thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. Thank you very much for being here. Um, very excited to present this material today, as I always am, because uh, I have a lot of passion for an underappreciated uh, figure in Thelema, of course, Carl Grimmer. Um, very brief introduction to the most important details in his bio relevant to OTO. He was the outer head of the order from 1947 at Crowley's death up until Germer's own death in 1962. <clears throat> he was also Crowley's successor as a head of AA, so a lot of legacy coming from Crowley to Germer that carried us forth into the modern era. Um, in spite of this, he is probably the uh, most unjustly, um, I don't want to say ridiculed, but um, He's not given his due in terms of his contributions to the success and even existence of modern Thelema for several reasons that I think will become apparent as we talk through things today. But one of my primary goals with this presentation and one of our primary goals in publishing the book that we're promoting with us today, uh, his uh, selected letters, is to show that he offered so much to his students through his instruction and correspondence. Uh, he offered so much to Thelema through his insistence on getting these uh, unpublished works published. Um, and in doing so, it, I, I, don't, I think it's a pretty good, pretty strong argument that he ensured the survival of Thelema into the modern era. What happens when people look at his legacy in terms of OTO specifically, most often, is that they see that he wasn't that keen on the initiatory system. He wasn't that keen on the activity that was happening in Los Angeles at Agape Lodge in the 30s, 40s, 50s. And um, his negativity toward that and his so admitted lack of knowledge about the initiatory system of OTO, um, knowledge and interest, um, it makes it easy to say, well, he just dropped the ball. Crowley dies, Germer takes over, and then initiations stop happening, he doesn't care about the system. You know, that's the kind of standard rap you hear about Germer. But it really misses this whole other dimension of how committed he was to the philosophy uh, and uh, spiritual traditions of Thelema, to the underlying teachings, especially on the mystical side, that uh, are so important to us today. And, and we largely know about some of the mystical um, interpretations and implementations of Thelema because of Germer's teachings to Jane Wolfe and Phyllis Eckler and others that have survived into modern generations. So we owe him a lot of thanks, and um, this is my little pep talk for Carl Germer today. <laughs> How many of you have not heard much about Carl Germer? Um, this is, to my knowledge, the first major publication uh, of any of this correspondence. It's been leaked out on the internet and such over the years, but this is really the first time it's been collected. And uh, spans 1928 to 1962, pre-Crowley, post-Crowley. And um, what I'm going to try to do today is walk you through some of the key points of the history as enlightened by the correspondence. So I'm going to be doing a lot of reading of letters today. I apologize in advance for uh, having so much of someone else's words here, but you know, it's going to be someone else's words. Pretty good choice. <laughs> um, so I'm certainly not going to make this a comprehensive history of, you know, the story of Crowley's death up to modern times, but um, because that would take weeks and be highly controversial and uh, uh, yes but I'll distill it all into a magical hour of your life uh, I'm telling this story mostly through Gerber's words as I said and I'm hoping that the potential annoyance of having me read a lot will be outweighed by the value of just hearing his actual thoughts uh, in the original because I think that is one of the main points we're trying to get across. He had a lot of valuable thoughts and a lot of valuable teachings. Mm -hmm. Yes? The passages you're going to read, are they in the letters? 
Yes, I believe, um, without any exceptions, everything I'm reading from today is in the book. You can go find out more. I didn't, unfortunately, bring a whole lot of copies to sell, but uh, there's some. And they'll make more if you order it. Uh, so uh, let me start in the 1930s. Uh, Germer had gotten in touch very early on, late 1920s, with Jane Wolfe, who, as you may know, had studied with Crowley at the Abbey of Thelema in Chefalu. So. Uh, she was an early confidant and correspondent of Germer's, and a lot of um, what came later was born out of the seeds of their developing relationship. So in 1931, uh, from Berlin, Germer writes to Wolf, You may believe me if I say that we're working on a very definite, close, and narrow financial schedule. Extravagances are eliminated. We are in fact living in a way which happier Americans, even taking into account the business slump there, cannot realize. For after all, the situation in Germany is so much worse, and so is the general standard. But this schedule must be assured. Assistance has got to come from America. I do not see why it should not be possible to mobilize your circle of people in such a way that actual visible results would show. What I'm trying to do is to convey to you the seriousness of the situation. Do not, if the amounts stated above are really humanly po impossible to obtain, I say do not react. Well, that is, of course, absurd, and this is not possible. We cannot do anything. The sums I gave are required. He's talking about sums of money for publishing. And so from the, from the earliest days of Germer being in a leadership position of OTO, you can see that he's concerned about publishing. He's concerned about fundraising for publishing. And this becomes a key source of conflict and confusion uh, from, to our modern eyes looking back on it, which I think we'll explicate a little bit. Um, his esteem for Jane Wolfe at the start is a little shaky, but by the 1950s he sees her as his uh, primary confidant and a shining example of a Thelemite, which I believe she was. So there's Jane on the beach at Chefalu. She's thinking to herself, I'm going to get Carl money for publishing as soon as we <laughs> <laughs> the focus of her meditation that day. I'm sure of it. So uh, by the late 30s, Jane is back in Hollywood, or at least in L at the LA area, uh, working at Agape Lodge. And um, she, of course, being the one in all of the United States who had studied uh, with Crowley at Lima, studied directly under him, she is really Crowley's, um, she's the voice of his personal teachings there. Everyone else is largely getting things secondhand. Um, and this becomes quite important. He, she also is the eyes and ears on the ground uh, with the activity in LA. So she's reporting to Germer, she's reporting to Crowley. Um, there's a discussion that starts uh, in the early 40s on trying to get Crowley to visit the US. Um, so you can imagine how awesome that would have been if they'd actually managed to get Crowley over for various reasons, as we'll see. They didn't. but. Um, in the discussion of why they're trying to get him over, there's some interesting material. Uh, Germer writes to Jane, uh, it seems to, be, seems to me quite natural that AC should think of coming over to stay and apply for American citizenship. The oath of allegiance can be taken by any Thelemite, as they stand for every country doing its true will, and they only want to help it to do it. So a lot of confidence in the uh, standards of America at the time. <laughs> um, I'll just leave that there. <laughs> but the, 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 the sense of America as a Thelemic Republic is an inspiring idea. Uh, let, us, let us strive, brothers and sisters, <laughs> to make this so. Um, in August of 42, Germer writes to Wolf, uh, worrying a lot about Crowley's health. And that starts to be another ongoing theme here. I'm going to use my flashlight every once in a while. I'd like to tell you more details about the situation in London. AC is most anxious to come over here, to a great part because of his health. I thought a certain scheme we had worked on would have materialized. All that was needed was a recommendation by a British Consul General in the USA. Certain influential <coughs> people approached him. At first he was quite favorably disposed, but had to make inquiries. 
A few days later, he was cold and distant and said he could not recommend AC's trip to this country. This makes me sure that the boycott is as strong as ever and that the present time, at the present time, no possible steps in that direction could succeed. I believe then that the planning should be to await a radical change due, I hope, in a year or so. Meanwhile, the vital thing is to keep AC in conditions in England so that no need worry that he need not worry about regular contributions, which will enable him to live comfortably, even under present restrictions. A decent home and possibility to eat adequately and get proper medical care. Also to pursue his activities, because a mind like his cannot exist without positive activity. So Crowley never did get to the U.S. Um, and of course died shortly thereafter, and we'll cover that period. But um, what if he had? Can you imagine if that late in his career he had made it to the U.S. to do some teaching in person, more people would have been exposed directly to him, and uh, he might have had better care over here amongst a larger community of Thelemites, but that was not to be. So, in 1942, Carl's wife Cora dies, and later that year he marries Sasha. This is their wedding invitation. It's a little late to RSVP, but I thought I would show it to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> Still show up that address? Yeah, give it a shot. <laughs> if anyone would show up at that address, it would be you. <laughs> Carrying the copy of the wedding invitation. Uh, in the late 30s and early 40s, again, Jane is really the eyes and ears on the ground in LA. Here she is with a mystery person, and then Regina Cole, who's one of the major uh, priestesses there at Agape Lodge, and Rhea Leffingwell, one of the core members. This is the altar at Agape Lodge. You've probably seen the photo before, especially the one with uh, Regina on the altar as priestess. That was upstairs in the attic of the house. And there is Lodge Night, Crowley Night, something like that. Crowley Night, 1937, at the Winona Boulevard home. I do not think all of these people are necessarily uh, members of OTO, but this was a, a large gathering <coughs> of some kind. The guy with the bow is John Carradine. John Carradine's in the photo. We have Jane Wolf, third from the right, peeking out. Uh, Regina there, uh, there. <coughs> so, parties were had. Uh, Grimmer writes, uh, as it is, you're the only one in your group, this is to Jane, you're the only one in your group whom I know and in whom I have confidence. As you're aware, 666 has vested quite a lot of authority in me and I, and to tell you the truth, I feel utterly inadequate to the task. I have always disliked the technical part of everything which goes with the order, though I realize that it is the way that appeals to many people, and is possibly their only path to achieve. But it is a fact that I feel lost in the grades, rituals, dignities, offices, rites, and whatnot. Also, I dislike the crowd of people who hang around. <laughs> I never get anywhere. <laughs> who do nothing but talk, jabber, ask questions, and would not understand your answers anyway. <laughs> Good thing times have changed. <laughs> I, I like our crowd these days, but Kermer uh, had his frustrations. Talk, ask questions, and jabber. Jabber, the jabbering is what gets you. <laughs> Um, so, around this time, as some of you may know, um, there's some drama around Wilfred Smith, who is nominally the head of OTO in the U.S. and Lodge Master in Agape at the time. Um, one of the functions that Jane Wolfe was playing on the ground in L.A. was to help Germer and Crowley keep an eye on some drama like this. So there are a lot of reports back and forth around Smith and Jack Parsons, who was also alternately the golden child and the scapegoat of the whole community, um, similarly with Smith. And so I think you'll see some pretty interesting back and forth on, on these characters. Um, Germer scapegoating of Smith is pretty extreme at uh, times and extends for decades in greater or lesser intensity. 
Uh, you also see decades worth of shifting allegiances among the Thelemites in Southern California, various factions sever ties with others and then reestablish them within a couple years. And Germer is trying to, hard to keep up with all of this via his letters with Jane and others, especially Jane. Is he still in Germany? He was in New York by this time, okay. but uh, New York and New Jersey. Eventually gets to California, which we'll see later. So uh, Jane tends to send these capsule summaries. Little, you know, here's who's showing up, and here's what they're like, and here's the problem child at the moment, and so on. Um, also, right about this time, Phyllis Seckler came into the picture. She uh, started working with, she joined OTO in 39, became uh, an AA probationer under Jane Wolfe in 1940. And one of the things she liked to do was draw these little sketches of life at the lodge. She also mm -hmm. lived at the lodge. Um, she started sending these sketches, she you know, shared them with Jane, of course, but then Jane was sending them to Germer, and Germer was sending some on to Crowley. And I want to read to you Phyllis's, uh, Phyllis is my teacher, of course, and I want to read to you some of her, uh, her annotation of this little sketch here of Life at the Lodge. We're going to learn about these people going clockwise, starting with Jane here. And this will give you a sense of Phyllis's sense of humor, too. Uh, here we have our happy family in a lighter mood. They are all discussing food as there is not enough of it on the table. <laughs> to introduce each from left to right, we start with Jane, who has that look because she has just been told to economize and everyone insists on eating everything up. <laughs> Next we have Joe, it's Joe Miller, the only one to laugh at his foul puns. <laughs> then comes Frederick, it's Frederick Millinger, looking a little wistful. We leave it, we leave it to you to guess at what. Big booking. <laughs> then comes Helen, Helen Parson Smith, pouring tea and listening to the din outside caused by Lisa's screaming, Stella's howling, those are Phyllis's kids, the <laughs> cats meowing, the bark of the dogs, and the mewing of the kittens. Then comes Wilfred, at the head of the table there, uh, smiling benignly on everyone's furbelows and foibles, and smoking instead of eating. On the other side is Regina, demanding more food. And next her, Grace, very quiet because she helped cook it. Jonas is eating as usual, and next to him, Phyllis laughs at anything anyone says. Jack is asking for more and more jam at the foot of the table. <laughs> and Betty, uh, that's Betty Northrup, who was later, uh, who later ran off with uh, Hubbard, uh, is very sweetly handing it to him. Honored guests in the room are the flies and ants. <laughs> it is this person's personal opinion that they got most of the food. <laughs> it was sketches like these that prompted uh, Crowley to say in a letter to Phyllis in 1943, I say it quite seriously, I have had more illuminating information from the cartoons in particular than I had from all the rest that has come from California in the last quarter of a century. <laughs> Uh, so, back to Germer more specifically. Um, as I said earlier, I think what he, or I hinted earlier, what I think he was best at is what is the least visible to most people. And that is the behind the scenes instruction and support and caring about the tradition overall and about the individuals in it. Um, but not a strength, and not one of his strengths in terms of the uh, administrative and magical matters of the order. Um, in 1947, he wrote to Jane, I'm not very happy about Agape Lodge, and I can't make suggestions or advise. You know that I know nothing about lodge affairs, initiations, formalities, so cannot comment on robes, etc. What must be done is to keep the little faithful group together, and not let them despair or become despondent, because there are no outward signs of growth. I feel that the work, the work of Thelema, is heading towards a crucial period and that important events are not too far off. Maybe a dry spell has to precede it, who knows. So he dissolved Agape Lodge temporarily in 1944, um, expressing frustration with the Lodge's poor support of Crowley. And he, he wants to hold off on reestablishing the Lodge because he believes people will actually spend their, they, what they were tending to do that was bothering him, was spending their money on supporting the Lodge, the actual building, the people in it, you know, rather than the order and the publishing program. So his closing down of initiatory work and the residential hub of that in LA 
uh, was not ignorance and it was not uh, antipathy to the order. It was seeing that the existence of this lodge at the time was undermining the work of Philema itself. This was the largest community of Thelemites in the world. <clears throat> and instead of that energy and money going to support keeping or getting things in print for the first time and uh, keeping the, the wheels turning there, uh, it, it was just sort of the resources were consuming themselves. So he wanted to stop that and get some focus on the bigger picture. Um, but that's that closing of Agape Lodge and that sense of him doing stuff like that, as, this as if he didn't care or just let it die or something is a real misconception. Yes? Um, I'm having a little bit of a hard time figuring out what he thought the bigger picture was. So far it sounds like mm -hmm. he thought that the purpose of the order was to publish Crowley's books and support Crowley. Uh, yeah, you can see uh, in some of the later material that I'm going to read, I think some of the underlying philosophical dimensions of what he thought the big picture was. I think that your question will answer itself then. Um, but yeah, so far, you know, in, the, in this era, he's pretty focused on the books exclusively. Uh, and um, But yeah, if by the end you haven't had that question or concern answered, we'll talk about it some more. Marlene? <laughs> Publishing the books is what got people to know what Crowley's message was. Mm -hmm. Very little had been published, and that was something that he continued to do without Gurma. Vision and the Voice wouldn't have been published. We didn't have any of that. So in order to spread the Lima, rightfully so, you had to have the materials to spread. And he didn't see that Agave Lodge was growing. They were maintaining barely. Of course, it was the Depression. <coughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, uh, in case that's not audible on the recording, thank you, Ryan. Um, the survival of Philema was, in many senses, inevitably linked to books being out there. Because, of course, pre-internet, um, you didn't have access to all the materials we do today. And some of these books, and we'll see some specific examples, th there was one manuscript in the world of Magic Without Tears, or Vision and the Voice. And, it's either going to disappear or rot away somewhere or get published. And so imagine the tragedy of something like that just being gone and never published. So he was really focused on the safekeeping of these materials. Um, his emphasis on publishing over the years, especially after Crowley's death, was often uh, driven by the fact that there was literally only one copy of a particular document. Um, and Pretty clearly, to put it succinctly, he felt that preserving this material for many generations was more important than postponing the work for the ostensible good of one generation. <laughs> so they continued to worry about Crowley's health in the mid-40s, and of course Crowley's getting close to his death. Um, writes to Jane in 45, I've been sending Alistair parcels regularly monthly. As you know, Alistair's nature requires sugar. <laughs> this being short, can I appeal to you? Uh, can I appeal to help for members of the West Coast? I don't know whether anybody has kept up sending AC parcels. If not, you know the type of products AC wants. I send them as a rule, take notes on this, red caviar, chocolate, dates, figs, or dried fruit, sardines, and sugar. <laughs> However, the one parcel I was allowed to mail every month is not very much, and his health is not of the best. He hates any of the improved scientific artificial products. So, he just needed a good co-op there in Hazel. <laughs> so Jack Parsons around this time takes over uh, the lodge master position of Agape, and Germer is still very worried about Smith. There's Parsons. Careful with that match. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> Question? So, when last we left the Gothay Lodge, it had been closed, and I lost track of which year, and now it's re like, So, how long was it dead for? You know, I don't have the exact time frame to mind, but I think it was a couple years. So Nothing Was, it, was it reopened <coughs> and handed back to Smith, or did it go straight on to Parsons? That's a little fuzzy, too. <laughs> um, Old documents. And 
and piecing that together in terms of specific timelines from the correspondence is just kind of tricky. Um, let's see. Okay. So Germer's worried about Smith still. There's Parsons. There's Smith. <clears throat> I dislike from the bottom of my convictions that Smith should stay on the same grounds as the Lodge. Some sort of contact cannot be avoided. Remember, at some point, Crowley had actually forbidden anyone in the OTO from having any contact with Smith. He'd gone from the head of the order in the U.S. to an ostracized uh, scapegoat, largely due to Crowley's impressions of what was going on on the ground, coming from uh, Germer through Jane and so on. So this is in a phase when he didn't want anybody to have contact with Smith. Uh, the atmosphere is bound to be uh, contaminated, and Jack is no match for Smith's infinitely wider experience and knowledge in arts magical and control of their forces. Jack thinks the older members are too immersed in Crowley to give their best to the order, that it is a divided interest. A young group plunging ahead, learning by its own mistakes, is healthier. That constant comparison is weakening. He may be right. To some extent, at least, I think he must be right. What do you think of this? Only then when you have time to write, however. And then uh, Jane writes back, uh, there's something strange going on quite apart from Smith. There is always Betty, remember, who thoroughly hates Smith. But our own Jack uh, is enamored of witchcraft, voodoo. From the start, he always wanted to invoke something, no matter what, I'm inclined to think, <laughs> so long as he got a result. Mm -hmm. According to Mika yesterday, he has had a result, an elemental he doesn't know what to do with. <laughs> From that statement of hers, it must bother him, somewhat at least. Uh, Germer de Wolf, 45. Jack's idea of getting a group together and inspiring it with fresh and young enthusiasm is perfectly fine. But will it work if the plan is to free them from adherence to Crowley? <laughs> it smells of Smith. <laughs> and there is the danger. Jack, in a recent letter to AC, said that he was praying for Smith. I am afraid that he has been uh, injected uh, with some Smith poison again. And that bodes ill for the order and himself, but also may explain the series of magical attacks. The burden is always thrown back on my shoulders of all those silly mistakes that some of the people who should know better insist on making, despite every kind of formal warning and the strictest of injunctions. Well, we'll see. Then Wolf de Germer, early 46. on meeting a new character in our story. Uh, I met Greedy McMurtry on the 17th, at which time he, Jack, Burlingame, and myself assembled at 1003, which is a new lodge uh, at a home that Parsons owned. Uh, Roy could not be there, but he had previously discussed matters with Grady and Jack. The result of this meeting was another entirely new program, which may or may not have been posted as yet. Grady also interviewed the members separately, his notes to go to headquarters. The notes of my interview, read back to me in which I signed, seemed rather mixed. But Grady put certain questions, and these only were answered. But he put in my mouth the statement that Jack's efforts were always sabotaged. I don't doubt Jack looks on it that way. In fact, I'm quite sure he does, but one cannot always overlook Jack's sappiness. He has a truly fine side, but that weather vane mind is difficult to take. He writes tip-top letters, says thus and so, and it gets no further than paper and ink. Uh, everybody at 1003, so I've been told today, has to dance to Betty's whims. This I have been told for some time, but I just learned yesterday that the damn fool has just recently executed a will making Betty his sole heir. She, by the way, has transferred her emotional life into the hands of one Ron Hubbard. A very likable Irishman. <laughs> who live here. And uh, Jack is the platonic friend accompanying the two lovers here and there, the genial elder brother. I would rather he got as mad as hell and accomplish something in the way of getting rid of Betty, uh, for it could so easily be that he hopes to get her back. Meantime, they are excellent friends, in quotes, with brotherly and sisterly embraces, and Betty will continue to be custodian of the property and hostess of the menage. <laughs> so... We get to 1947, and everyone is realizing Crowley's close to death, and so um, I want to take you through a sequence of correspondence that highlights not just the facts and the emotions around that, but also what you can feel as a shifting uh, weight of responsibility to Germer, taking 
you can sort of see it through his correspondence, see it dawning on him. You know, oh shit, I'm in charge now, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the way that that changes a person. So to Jane Wolfe in 1947, May 1947. Alistair is preparing for his death. I'm not so sure that he will be allowed to die yet, but living in his condition is, it seems, agony. His lungs are too far gone and death would be a relief. So we have to face the facts. I'm not sure whether you should tell everybody as fully as I'm writing to you. I leave this to your judgment. It is, however, in my mind to make the journey to London if it can be managed. Um, Germer fails to visit Crowley as planned after he was denied a visa to enter the UK later in 1947. And unfortunately, he never got to see Crowley again. Crowley dies late uh, 1947. This was the last word of the equinox in his hand in September of that year. And this is how most of America found out about Crowley's death. A telegram from Kermer to Jane Wolfe. So Germer, in uh, shortly after Crowley's death, writes to Mildred and uh, Ray Burlingame, uh, words are too weak to express the grief that has been upon me since the fatal news arrived by cable Tuesday morning. It is not so much the sorrow about Alistair's death. On that, I feel rather a relief that his suffering the suffering of his body and his unfathomable loneliness during these last years has been ended at last. This loneliness has been deeper than possibly at any time during the many, many years since he has been awake. I mean that in the sense of the wake world, etc. This loneliness is over, and as I see it, the very condition for his final attainment, which he expressed in his cable to me of November 18th. After that, it seems there was nothing left to keep him here. But what grieves me so insufferably is that, in retrospect, I see how often, how very often during the years, over 22 now, that I have known Alistair, I placed obstacles in his path. I obstructed and sometimes made his life hell for the man AC. I thought I could make good during the months that I thought I could stay with him from September to early December of this year, but the British, who have crucified their greatest son and who persecuted him with their hatred, have remained true to form to the very last by refusing me a visa. And though AC knew that the visit was not to be and must not be, he felt the cancellation of my journey as a deep blow. There is no secret about it that our relation had been from the start close and intense, closer than men generally can judge. His work that was his life must and will continue and be brought gradually to the success and glorification that he should have seen during his earthly life. So Gerald York, uh, uh, never mind, I'm going to skip that one. Um, <coughs> always difficult to make it through those passages. So as I said, with Crowley's death, you can start to feel the weight of responsibility shifting to Grummer's shoulders and his eyes widening at that. But uh, a real, um, a real maturity, and uh, I would use the word grace. I think starts to come out in his writings, that I think is indicative of him taking this very seriously. So this was um, to Jane Wolfe in December '47, around the same time, shortly after Crowley's death. All the holy books contain passages which have intrigued students. Every one of us sins against the rule laid down in the comment of, of Al, uh, AC, most of all. But then, of those whom I know personally, Leah, Mudd, IWE, Smith, Jack, etc., etc., some lost the balance of their minds completely and went insane. Ahad is still pursuing his insane dreams. I have strong indications that AC, up to almost his end, had not rid himself of old interpretations of certain passages. Be ready to fly or to smite may be one of them. The trouble is that no one knows on what plane these books or some particular verses have to be interpreted. I believe that all prophetic messages, passages in the holy books, are realized or understood after the event has taken place. To interpret them before lends invariably to obsession. 
AC wrote to comment, in a rage of despair, renewed proofs of Mudd's insane obsessions about his interpretations of passages and all. As long as we are human and live on this plane, the constitution of our minds is bound to keep making us air. I even don't think there is anything wrong with that, except that we ought to train our mind to doubt, doubt, and continue to doubt, and with its help develop a method to check and balance the activities of that mind, and remain detached, distant, from all our conclusions. AC, of course, has preached this constantly and practiced it. With a vivid, imaginative, brilliant mind like his, he was always in greater danger than others. So, Crowley had a son toward the end of his life. Of course, Alistair had a Turk on his last wife. And he asked the members of the order to take care of his son after his death. And there he is. It's quite clear from subsequent correspondence that he was kind of a little terror. Uh, especially as a teenager, it was passed around from the home of one Thelemite to another uh, for as long as they could tolerate him. <laughs> Moved along. Uh, but his mother, uh, Deidre McAlpine, wrote to Germer in January of 48, shortly after Crowley's death, I can well understand your sorrow at not seeing Alistair again. When I think how nearly I never found him and how nearly Alistair Atatürk never got to know his father, it makes me feel quite sick. I wonder whether it would be any use for you to know that he died without fear, and in the end without struggle. I am sure you would never suspect him of fear, but there seems to have grown up an unaccountable feeling among quite a number of people that Alistair would, would be or was afraid to die. He was not. He faced death as he faced life, fearlessly and in full consciousness accepted it. Around this time, uh, Germer seems to be growing concerned about a potential, potential struggle with Gerald York over the archives of Crowley. He's worrying that York is going to outbid the OTO for uh, Crowley's estate. He writes to Lewis Wilkinson to attempt to arrange to pay off Crowley's debt, an undischarged bankruptcy, and <clears throat> he's trying to ascertain what materials have been secured, what books are in press, how to ship materials to the U.S., and so on. He says, uh, this is writing to Jane. Uh, I'm enclosing a copy of AC's will, which came yesterday. I saw my lawyer about it, who thinks there should not be a loophole, especially so as a former will of 1942, the original I have, is even plainer. But the British refusing my entry and certain things have to be, having to be attended within hours after his death, he drew it up as at present. Uh, I do not think it would be wise to broadcast this will to everybody. We must get hold of all the files and manuscripts, etc., etc., for the order and get it over to this country first, and prevent legal entanglements which those forces who have other interests would well know how to stir up. It would be fine, a fine mess if the British would suddenly claim these were British assets of inestimable value and must not be exported to foreign countries, <coughs> or that his copyrights had a value, or whatnot, or that the OTO was not a legal or registered body or organization with whom they could deal, and so on. There are innumerable reasons for my worry until the whole stuff has arrived here. So again, that's his big picture of the moment. What's going to happen to all the stuff? How do we make sure it's safe? How do we make sure we can still have control of publishing uh, with the OTO? <coughs> in March of 48, Germer begins a discussion of incorporating OTO in a letter to Grady McMurtry, uh, and he relocated OTO headquarters to Barstow, California. Uh, or he was contemplating re relocating to Barstow or to Pennsylvania or somewhere in uh, somewhere in uh, Southern California near Roy Leffingwell's property. <coughs> um, and then right about this time, Germer's also planning a visit to California. He says, uh, I know my true will has to do with the establishment of 93, the current itself. At this moment, however, we're all living in a sort of vacuum or interregnum and we must be patient until the salient material bearing on some of the matters of the AA and OTO have arrived and are sifted and studied by me. More about this when I've arrived. So they're trying to buy, <coughs> the Grummer is trying to buy a property in uh, Palm, Pennsylvania, which is this little town between Allentown and Reading, uh, and they're seeking financial support to start a headquarters there. Uh, this fall th falls through with some probate issues with the previous owner, and they end up in Hampton, New Jersey, 
instead. There's continued discussion of goings on at Agape Lodge, who's around, who's the problem, who's good. Um, Germer finally gets all his stuff from Belgium, which had been confiscated there. You'll remember he spent uh, two stays in a uh, concentration camp, two different concentration camps, uh, because of his esoteric affiliations. And uh, that actually is one of the things that, on the mystical side, gets overshadowed in terms of Germer's life because of all this other stuff we've been talking about with publication, uh, OTO activity, that in a concentration camp, without any philemic books or other materials, through mental recitation of the holy books, he attained knowledge and conversation of his holy guardian angel, and it had many mystical insights in that process that he continued to teach to Jane and to, to Phyllis later. So a lot of the instruction about the nature of the relationship between the <coughs> adept and the angel comes through the filter of Germer's experience as taught through Jane and Phyllis and their experiences. Um, so our, our modern understanding of what all that even is, is largely uh, in debt, we're in debt to uh, Germer for that. Not that you shouldn't form your own opinions based on your actual experience, <laughs> always. So what they were trying to do around this time to keep the books going was there might be one copy of something or a few copies of a manuscript. So when someone would get a copy, they wanted a copy of a book, they'd be given the manuscript and they had to make a copy in order to have a copy. <laughs> so meaning type it for the most part. So uh, you see Phyllis and others um, typing up uh, in their entirety books like Vision of the Voice and such. Continuing to be in despair about the quality of the aspirants at Agape Lodge. They're looking for who might be promising. Uh, Germer worries about uh, Frederick Hyde Jones potentially attempting to activate his 10th uh, degree at OTO leadership in North America. And I didn't know this until I was pouring through some of these documents. Um, they were even considering the possibility of changing the name of the organization. Uh, to continue some, under some other banner entirely if it came down to it because of challenges from mm -hmm. Jones or perhaps because of copyright issues in England or whatever. Uh, some of the old guard of the Agape Lodge begin to withdraw, at least temporarily, like the Berlin Games. Um, Germer is uh, quite concerned about still about the safety of the archives. And here's an interesting passage from Germer to Wolf in 1949 uh, concerning sort of messages from beyond. Mm. I'm sorry to hear about your health, but hope you will feel better now. Uh, Sasha gets frequent messages from 666. Sasha is Germer's wife. Sasha gets frequent messages from 666 intended for herself and me. Interpret that how you will. Uh, there has been some sort of a warning as though there was a phase of magical attacks but they must be expected, faced, passed, and taken in stride. We must have the firm confidence that our work is in the hands of the gods. The secret chiefs are watching it, and those who live in this work, without deviating from the lines laid down and doing their practices regularly, will have automatic protection. Those who fall down and do not live up to their work will feel it soon enough. So keep up with your daily banishings, everyone. <laughs> Uh, this is an example of Crowley, uh, of Germer, uh, taking uh, an interest in the practical side of it in the sense of everyone's individual work and caring for your sort of magical hygiene. Uh, Jane Wolfe is tasked with collecting all the rituals and papers of OTO for safekeeping. Uh, they're sending food and clothing and financial support to Patricia <laughs> McAlpine and Alistair Ataturk. And finally do wind up Agape Lodge uh, around this time, at least for a, a few years. Um, I think this is the best way to wind up financial matters of Agape Lodge. I suppose you know that orders, lodges, etc. have never appealed to me. I feel in that atmosphere as a fish on land, yet it is doubtless a method that has much appeal to many others. For that reason, I would welcome someone who in the future would start a new flaming movement on a lodge basis. In that case, I think a new name should be adopted. Agape Lodge being defunct does in no way touch the OTO as a whole. 
nor has it any bearing on your personal activities of pushing 93 or of keeping the group together. Now around this time, um, Germer gets starts to get a little paranoid about the FBI. Um, no doubt, and God knows, <clears throat> having come through his experiences in Germany, worrying about government and the intrusiveness into uh, your activities was something he knew all too well. Um, but you can tell at certain points that he's, he's, he's bridged from realistic fear to a little bit of paranoia around it, or a little too much energy put into it at least. Um, he feels it's connected with his work with AC, and he's worried it's going to uh, interfere with you know the work of the order. Um, Germer is suspicious that Parsons and Smith have reemerged around 1950 and are working together to independently publish Crowley material. Smith seems to have a uh, working group of 25 or 30 people. Um, Smith uh, founded something that he called the Church of Thelema around that time down in LA, and you can still, in our archives, we still have uh, some publications of Book of the Law and other things labeled as Church of Thelema publications. Uh, early 1950, Phyllis Seckler reemerges now that her children are school age and she's had more time for school and polemic work. Um, and in 1951, uh, Germer writes to Wolf contemplating how to move forward with initiations, which is unusual coming from Germer. Like, hey, let's do initiations. They're discussing only two or three individuals as being suitable for initiation in all of Southern California. They found two or three. So. <laughs> I think our ratios have improved. <clears throat> this, again, this is Garmin to Wolf. Your full report on this and your views are needed for a wider position that I may have to take in all OTO matters. I'm in a peculiar situation. 666 left me with tremendous responsibility, knowing full well that I know nothing about rituals, order, and lodge setup. Now I have some serious candidates and would need a man like VOVN, that's Smith, to supervise in a practical way the workings or setting up a branch elsewhere. So here's Smith again, who now Germer seems to feel he needs him to help advise on the rituals. But Germer, Wolf, and Seckler are all very, very cautious about Smith still. Uh, Grady now moves to California or from California to D.C. to the Pentagon, setting up. Uh, camp there and where, where he will remain until the late 60s when uh, Phyllis flies him out to California and they restart OTO. Um, in the early 50s, the focus is still mostly on copying manuscripts and moving toward publishing Vision and the Voice. Um, Wolf, Seckler, and York are all campaigning for Lieber Aleph, so Gerber turns his attention there. Um, Seckler, in particular, is actively typing up various texts. And L.A. Thelemites are gathering only sporadically for uh, solstice and equinox masses at the Smith's home. And then in June of 1952, Jack Parsons was blown up uh, in his garage. And then, I don't know if you knew this part of it, but his mother committed suicide later the same day. Mm -hmm. So they had a memorial mass soon after. We as Thelemites have not gathered together tonight to grieve over the death of a brother. We might personally wish he had not been in such a hurry to leave us. Brother John Whiteside Parsons has taken his last journey with the sun. We celebrate the Mass in his honor and to speed him on his way in the furtherance of his true will. So after Jack's death, Germer reconsiders his opinions about Jack. Uh, and he, he gone back and forth many times on this. You can read probably a series of 20 letters between him and Jane Wolfe where one letter will be, he's the biggest problem we've ever had, and the next one will be, he's the most promising student we have. <laughs> uh, largely that's dependent on what Jane has just said to him about what's going on. Uh, so uh, it's a little hard to tell what's actually going on. Uh, but right after his death, uh, Germer says, we needed a man of his youth, his caliber, understanding, faculty for mastery, so very badly. Now that I see proofs for that, uh, it makes me sad. But a year later, he said, in talking about uh, Cameron Parsons, um, 
Cameron, tell me when there is news. The more distaste, the more distant, sorry, the more distant I get, the more I doubt the genuineness of either Jack's Babylon Book 49 and of Candy, which is Cameron. However, no, one never knows. Uh, so, it used to be Jack, now Cameron becomes a focus of this kind of, is she the golden child or the uh, pariah, we can't tell. Um, golden pariah. Golden pariah, yeah. <laughs> Let's just take an average. <laughs> So in July of 53, Germer himself is frustrated with his own indecision on this sort of thing. He writes to Jane, Damn it, as you say, I cannot reach a balanced view of the Cameron stuff. Jack's Libra 49 is clearly nonsense. So <laughs> having reached that conclusion, I'm liable to judge Cameron's things in a similar way. But who knows? There are peculiar forces at work. We have to wait for the outcome, and that may take years. Um, now, in 1952, we're rounding the bend in the, the last few years up to uh, the death of Jane Wolfe, and so their relationships, uh, Germer's relationship with her starts to take a turn toward uh, uh, more, more personal concern, and uh, as Jane became uh, more demented and had uh, trouble caring for herself, was put in a home eventually, uh, for a time lived with the Germers in California. Um, so you can start to see sort of a, a more personal um, correspondence about, you know, how are you doing, how's your health holding up, that sort of stuff. But also uh, deeper matters of, you know, sharing emotion, sharing worries and such. Uh, Germer writes to Wolf, um, I have much, very much on my heart and mind which I'd like to talk over with somebody who understands if I would be able to see you today, I would make more of that rare opportunity when we had those quiet talks at your home the last time I was there. There are so many problems that I am facing, and there is no one with whom I can discuss them, and who has the maturity plus the purity of soul and aspiration at this end. And then Jane writes back, uh, I can grasp somewhat at least of the weariness of spirit, your weariness of spirit. Time was in Chefalu when I heard A.C. with a great sigh wish he could be like other men. But he was a dedicated man, as you are, my dear Carl. Life was burdensome at times, but though it ran through golden threads of love, sunshine, moments of gaiety even, and the solace and companionship of Iwas for work done, the cross of sacrifice made bittersweet. The Lima needs you badly. Who else is there? We need you. The whole damn world needs you. Beginning in 1952, Germer has some intense correspondence with Phyllis on the nature of the HGA, as I was hinting at earlier, and some practical discussion of publication, typing, etc. Germer is at his best here, encouraging, humble, honest, and at times profoundly wise, in my view. For example, this letter to Phyllis about the nature of contact with the HGA. This is May of 1953, uh, soon after Phyllis's own KNC experience. In the early stages, of our primitive natures require actual, visible, sensible proof of an outer being contacting us. I remember in my early period, I sometimes asked for a definite sign in order to reassure me in some sort of weak phase <clears throat> to give evidence that I was on the right track. Yet, this is important in my case, I never connected such signs as coming from a definite outer being. I just took it as from God or such things. Mm -hmm. My conception of the HGA has probably only been condensed after AC's death. Funny? Unbelievable? It is so. The HGA has been taking almost violent, desperate attempts to bring me to the realization of his existence and presence and operation. But my hide was, and still is, too dense. So that AC once in the 1927 period wrote, instead of a skin, you have a carapace. <laughs> and this, not as a joke, but rather in despair. <laughs> uh, 1953, work begins on publishing Magic Without Tears. Those of you who have published books or helped will uh, rejoice to know that some things never change. The first printing had magic spelled without the K on the cover and spine, but it was too late. And it, it had been missed in the proofing stage. Just as an aside. Um, Germer continues with suspicion of Cameron, thinking that she's publishing OTO rituals illicitly. 
He's worried about Louis Culling and Smith incorporating OTO outside of Germer's jurisdiction. Germer renews the ban of Smith. Smith is pissed off enough not to mind. <laughs> Germer defends Wolf against Smith's attacks. Um, he's trying to sell the New Jersey house and move to California. Um, you know, and in retrospect, I think, it, you know, listening to the history of how he was remotely uh, trying to find out about activities at Agape Lodge from the East Coast riding to Jane, in retrospect, you can see that it probably would have been good if they'd made it to California many years earlier so they could actually be on site and um, pull the levers, you know, from closer by. But they eventually land in West Point, California. Uh, first to Barstow and then to West Point, which is up in the uh, Amador County area in the foothills. Why Barstow? Um, I don't know why Barstow specifically, except oh, it's close to, yeah. You're <laughs> 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 baby. Three, three, three. <laughs> so uh, there's discussion of bringing Alistair Ataturk to the U.S., which does eventually happen. Um, they even consider adopting him, the Germers. Uh, <laughs> they're like, dodged a bullet there. <laughs> Alistair Ataturk eventually ends up working in Newark, New Jersey and living with the Germers. Over the next several years, he passes through the households of several California Thelemites, more or less alienating everyone and not capable of keeping a job. Uh, I don't think the rest of his life was much happier. You get conflicting stories of what the rest of his life consisted of and how he died and how old he was and everything. I don't know if we have a definitive word on that at this point. Um, <clears throat> Germer's musing to, to Wolf on the progress of Thelema in general in 1954. On the whole, I would say that the enemy's war against 93 has been bitter, relentless, and bitter. It is growing, perhaps toward a climax. I just keep plodding along, though it breaks my work and the easy flow of concentration. Yet there are signs of progress in other parts of the world for the spreading of Thelema, so I must not kick. In, by 1957, the Garmers are caretaking for Jane. Um, they're living in West Point, as I said. Uh, Jane dies in March of 1958. Uh, and Phyllis Seckler continues as Germer's primary confidant. Now, you remember that Seckler had been an AA student under Wolf with Wolf's death, and Germer in charge of AA. Germer, by default, but also by relationship, is um, counseling uh, Seckler on her, her work. Sometimes it seems, frankly, that Seckler is his only confidant in this phase of time, this late 50s. Um, so Germer writes to Phyllis in March of 1959, Have you heard from any Thelemites? <laughs> uh, the Southern group uh, seemed to have cut their ties, uh, seemed to cut themselves off completely. And as for Grady, he seems to have deteriorated further. So that... Uh, he even no longer pays the, uh, the $10 per month of his about $500 loan. <laughs> Have you heard from him? And later, uh, to Phyllis at the very end of Germer's life, as, as she was expressing frustration at being tied to a mundane job rather than working full-time on magical pursuits, something we can all relate to. Right? <laughs> Germer to Phyllis again. You may be called on to do much for Thelema yet when the time is ripe. It, you would be ideally fitted for work for which I am lamentably ill-equipped. But what will you? We all have first to, uh, to fulfill and put in order the mundane things before we are permitted release to do higher things. Meanwhile, he's quite disillusioned with the U.S. in 59. Um, the USA is utterly hopeless for serious spiritual work. <laughs> in fact, the country has sunk so deep in matter that the world at large has long taken notice of the spiritual, moral, political confusion permeating everything in this old and desolate land. <laughs> 59. <laughs> um, so, pardon? Prophetic. Prophetic. <laughs> or just, the song remains yeah. the same. <laughs> um, so um, Germer 
enters uh, the phase of his final illness and death. He has prostate cancer and uh, has some complications following surgery, dies in uh, late October of 62. Uh, West Point. This is uh, Sasha Germer, Jane Wolfe, Phyllis Eckler, and Carl Germer at the, uh, at the end of the very end of Jane's life. This is what's left of the Germer's uh, library and archives after the break-in, when they really ransacked the place. So Phyllis and a few others went and discovered it in this shape and took photos. Got a whole thick book of photos like this. Um, you know, one of the things that's especially inspiring to me about Germer that uh, I hadn't quite put into these words in this presentation is that it's easy to come into this line of work, to come into Thelema, to join a Thelema community, to start your studies, to see people writing books or giving lectures or whatever, and think to yourself, that's what it means to be a Thelemite. You advance through the grades, you write books, you give lectures, you lead groups. But that's not what it means to be a Thelemite. That's just what it means to be a Thelemite for those particular people. <laughs> Germer's example shows us that it's not always about being a great ritualist. It's not always about writing original material. It's not always about, um, you know, following the book of, uh, by the book of running an order or anything like that. It's about finding your true will, living your life accordingly, knowing your strengths, building a life around the strengths of your will and doing your best to execute it with passion. And if he hadn't done that, we wouldn't be here, I fully and firmly believe. He wrote in 1942 to Jane along these lines, my path is different from most others, therefore I cannot very well teach in the academic sense. I possibly need personal contact to inflame, inspire, and encourage. I dislike words and conceptions like chela and the relation it alludes to. You yourself are advanced enough to help people along. You have lived with AC. You know the substance of what it was all about. Have confidence in your own self and nature. Speak yourself. I mean, express yourself. Every star is independent and has his own language. So find your own and work accordingly. If AC is a sunflower and you are a rose, Desire to smell, grow, and blossom like one, and forget to stare at the other, whose life, nature, and self-experience, whose laws are different from your own. Don't be afraid to be mistaken. What does it matter? Only don't try to make another rose out of a star soul that may represent a thistle. And finally, uh, March of 61, Germer to Phyllis Seckler. The great work of Rao Horquit is visibly progressing. I must have expressed it often to you that periods of time in which they live are different from ours. It is so hard and agonizing for us humans to accept theirs. He's capitalizing theirs, talking about the gods or whoever. It is so hard and agonizing for us humans to accept theirs and to learn to see and understand theirs and to learn and adapt our vision of Libra Legis to it as well as our life. It would be so nice to see Liber Legis established in the world in our time, to see all the prophecies fulfilled, those of chapter 3 and those of chapter 1, verse 61, etc. No wonder that so many whom I know have known, that I've known have fallen by the wayside because they have begun to doubt the book. Even A.C. had spells, for in the early days of 93 it seemed so fantastic that he should be chosen for such a tremendous job. Even in the 22 years that I was more or less around him, he suffered from being unable to bring about the acceptance of the law. Oh, and how he suffered. But here's a, the final message that I think we can all listen to uh, carefully today. Where are helpers today? Where are the generation of men and women that will accomplish the next step? Much has been done in Germany. I see small and delicate plants trying to spring up here and there. So it encourages me to hear of your new venture. One can never know what will grow of it, but uh, one should not care. 
All you can do is heed the impulses from your HGA. So, brothers and sisters, let us honor the hopes and dreams of our Thelemic ancestors and take up the mantle that has fallen to us. Whether we're considering the legacy of Karl Germer or of any other Thelemite or of Crowley himself, the only important question in the end is, what are the fruits of our work? Our success will be the sign of Thelema's victory. So, thank you for your attention today. Thank you.